All right, welcome back to The Basement. In this episode, we're gonna continue the build series of my first 100% from scratch custom bass guitar that you see right here before you. Let's get after it. All right, so off camera, I tested some dye. This is actually a water-based dye stain from, actually this is what it is. General finishes dye stain, blue, water-based. This is a really highly figured scrap. I don't think the rest of the, any of the rest of the body actually, this came from this, I wanna say it came from this end. I don't know, not sure. Um, I tested it on a scrap from the neck blank. Yeah, I think I'm gonna leave it. Okay, I am still struggling with decisions on you know, what fretboard to use. I still think I need to try and keep it relatively low risk. Because uh, I really don't, I, my favorite, I'm just going to, my favorite is absolutely this piece of Patagonian rosewood. This is just gorgeous. And I think with the blue, this would look phenomenal. It's a really, really highly figured piece. I think I can probably get four fretboards out of this if I do four string um, and still have like a chunk, like six to eight inches to cut off. The camera does not pick it up, but there's lots of flaming in this board and it's just, just beautiful. That said, because it is so, so beautiful and so unique, I'm really, really, this is a, definitely quarter sawn as well. I'm afraid to use this for my first build. I just am. Because I don't know that I can rip this or resaw this perfectly in half, which is what I would need to do in order to keep as much material out of this as possible. And yeah, I could ab absolutely get two fretboards out of this, but I think I could get four. Um, maybe that's just me being greedy. Oh man, that just looks so good up against this blue though. Look at that. That's, that's the look, you know, this wouldn't be bad either. Once this darkens up just a little bit, uh, this is cherry. So this will get a little bit more red under finish. I think, I think this is cherry. Um, and this is riff sawn. So still plenty stable. This is the same wood that's actually in the neck already, which is why I favor it and why I was originally thinking that. Um, I have nothing that, I have no fretboards on any of my seven bases. And I'll, yes, I have seven bases now before this one is done. Um, I don't have anything with a light fretboard anymore. I had a maple fretboard on my first ever five string. I don't really, like maple fretboards, but I think with a matching blue headstock. So if I veneer the headstock to match the body, I think that would look super cool. So option number two, uh, color wise, I think this is a great choice up against this blue is this piece of Jatoba. This is really heavy, really dense, and it's got a really cool striated, almost sapili mahogany-like saw to it, uh, saw grain to it, because it's 100% quarter saw. You know, the other option I was really highly considering is this piece of Paduk. That against the blue, especially being there's not a whole lot going on. Some um, Not a whole lot going on with this. This is riff saw. Um, Got a lot of pores in it, a lot of open pores, which is not unlike a rosewood. And I do like the that orangish color with the blue. That's kind of interesting. I don't think I've seen anything like that. So then I've got this flame slash curly maple. It's labeled curly maple from the store I bought it from. That's an option as well. This purple heart is heavy and super flamed. I, 
it's not my vibe. I can see it and it's beautiful in my head, but that's like too much color going on, I think. I want, I don't know. It's not my vibe. I like the, I like this piece best. This is my favorite. So, I don't know. Anyway, so I'm gonna get these off the bench and figure out what I'm gonna work on tonight. I think I should probably make a neck pocket template and sort out the neck pocket. That would feel like progress is, that would make it at least feel like progress is being made. So I think that's, I think that's the move. Let's make a routing template for the neck pocket. All right, so the first step in making this template is getting some MDF prepared. So I'm using some 3 8 inch MDF. I'm just ripping it to size and just cutting off the chunks I need. I'm cutting off two template blanks, one for the pickup templates and one for the neck pocket. And striking a center line on the neck template blank and uh, kind of figuring out roughly the depth that I want to set it to into the body and then aligning everything with the center line, making sure I'm happy with how far back I need to go, making those measurements and transferring them over to the template stock. And yeah, just making sure I've got center lines throughout so that I can reference off of. Then I trace the heel of the neck into the template and make sure it's all good. Then I take it over to the drill press and I go into where the heel meets the body, those rounded corners. Uh, just pick a drill bit that matches the radius of those corners before I take it to the bandsaw, cut the straight lines, and then I flip the drill press, press, and I flip the drill press over and reveal my hidden scroll saw and cut that one perpendicular cut. I could have just used a coping saw, but hey, got a scroll saw, so use it. And then I just refine the shape with files and rasps. I'm really, really, really particular with this step because I want to creep up on it and make sure it fits as precisely as I possibly can. Um, this is one of those tedious steps where it's just a lot of referencing back and forth with the actual neck itself because this template is specific to this particular neck. The next four string base I use that uses the same neck size and profile. I'll be able to reuse this template over and over and over again um, in combination with the neck template that I have, but it's important that you get it precise. So obviously I shot this video over a year ago when I built this base and somehow I lost some of the footage of me using the template, both for the neck pocket as well as the pickup cavities. So here you see me after having gone and made the first pass with the template, um, just going and referencing off of those cuts I already made and uh, getting it down to depth. I always start on the drill press with a Forstner bit to hog out most of the material and then I break out the router and the templates. So that's pretty standard stuff. Now you'll see on the lower horn there's a little sliver of wood on the body that I end up having to deal with, but you'll see that later. Well, I am super stoked. This is actually looking like an instrument right now. This is my first ever neck pocket. And how's that for a press fit? It's pretty freaking solid. I am super stoked. I'm aligned with center line. I'm, this is a powerful, this is a powerful moment for me. This, the many pieces become the one. This is, uh, this is a proud moment. Like I'm beyond pleased with how this is coming together. So stoked. So I am gonna do a matching headstock to the body. Uh, I may have to cut off a, another piece. I don't think I have a scrap big enough to do it in one piece. Same thing with the rear control cover. Um, ugh. I've got to get a router with dust extraction. This is ridiculous, but I'm still super pumped. 
so pumped I don't know what the heck I need to do next. I know I need to slim down this neck. It is way too thick, especially once I put a fretboard on it. It's going to be a bloody monster. So I think I have to decide on the fretboard and I think it has to be this one. So before I start thinning down this neck, I need to figure out how high off the fretboard or how high off the body this thing needs to be. And yeah, that's where I'm at right now. I need to figure out how high off of the body does the fretboard need to sit based on the height of the bridge and um, kind of go from there. Take some measurements on existing bases and try and get it close to that and just see what we see. If it's a little lower in the back end, I'm fine with that because the obviously the bridge saddles will raise and lower. Um, I have to consider that there is going to be a radius in the fretboard. So I need to figure out just like how thick this neck should be based on the depth of this neck pocket. So I shot for about halfway through the thickness of the body for the neck pocket is what I shot for. And uh, that's where I'm at. So super excited. I need to figure out the control layout and positioning and then the control cavity. I want to have a side mount jack versus a top plate mount, especially if I'm going to go with a wood pick guard. Um, be stronger that way. I've ordered some. I'm going to probably have it sit right about there, which means this control cavity is going to have to be a weird shape, a really weird shape, kind of like about like that, but bigger on this end for the actual pots. So I want to leave enough room in here for a nine volt battery and a preamp should I decide to add one at a later date. So that's kind of where I'm at. I've got lots of thinking and planning to do. And that means I'm going to go at a slower pace because these are as critical of move as, as setting the neck into the body. The rest of this is equally critical for the action and playability of this guitar. So I am not, I am not taking this for granted at all. But man, I am so pumped. I am so pumped this thing not only fits, but fits pretty freaking well. That's like amazing. I probably got a little bit of cleanup to do. I don't know how worried about that I actually am. But man, I'm pumped. All right, so now I'm getting the fretboard now that I finally made a decision on what wood to use. I'm going to use the same wood that I used to make the neck, or the maple stripes in the neck. So first I trim it to rough length, and then I kind of trace it out on the neck template, rough it to width and taper. and make sure I didn't screw it up. I've got a little bit of a, I got a little bit of a twist in this blank. So I wanna try, before I glue this on, I've gotta try and sort it out. So I figured out which side is concave and which side is convex. So I'll work on that and then obviously, this neck is really thick. It's almost as thick as the guitar body, probably a quarter inch thinner than the guitar body. So I've got to thin this neck down too and get some measurements. So I think tonight with the limited time I have to work on this, because it's 11.30 p.m. right now, I think I'm just going to, it'd be great to get the fretboard glued on and in the clamps. It would be great to do that. So I got to figure out the thickness of this thing needs to be, and I got to see if I can get this twist out. But if I'm smart, I would get the twist out and then let it sit for a while and see if it moves. Hmm. 
let's do that. Let's get the twist out, thickness it, see how much it moves. I mean, this is a giant thick neck that I don't think is gonna do anything. It hasn't moved yet, I don't think. I do have to thickness it down quite a bit, so it may move as I thickness it down. So let's see what the individual pieces do before I proceed. Because I can always work on the body in the interim. So let's do that. That's plan. That's the plan. All right. So now it's time to get into jointer mode. So I'm taking the cup side so that it's arching upward. So I have two points of contact on both sides of the jointer table and I get that side flat first. Then I convert the jointer planer into planer mode after I'm happy with how flat I got it. And I start running it through the planer and getting it down closer to the actual final thickness. Now I'm not worried about getting it too thin because I am going to have to sand in a radius by hand. So I do leave it a little bit thick. All right, this is as thin as I'm going to take it. I've got a tiny bit of uh, planer snipe on the end, but I will have to, um, I will have to take a smoothing pass with my number seven jointer just to get some of these machine planer marks out. I'm sure it'll joint up fine. I just want to do a clean jointer pass. So this is what we're left with. It's really flat now, actually. It's way flatter than when we started, so I'm happy with that. And the flattest side is the one that's facing down. My workbench is not completely flat. So this board is though, and that feels really good. So while I've got this thing in planar mode, I'll pop the neck out, pop the truss rod out and take some measurements and get this thing closer to final thickness. All right, well, I've got the jointer planer in jointer mode. I pull the neck off and I start taking about, I don't know, quarter inch to three eighths of an inch off the back side of the neck. Cause I already have the truss rod slot in there. I got a long way to go, but I'm at my midnight roll mark. So I have to shut it down at midnight. So no more power tools for tonight. It's getting there though. Got about, it's like a quarter of an inch. I said, rather sneak up on this and be a thousand percent sure of these measurements. So that, so I'm gonna leave it. So this is a crotch figure slab of spalted pecan. And it is super punky. I was looking forward to potentially making guitar bodies out of this, but there, I don't think there's enough solid wood in here to do that. It's just, it's, it's super shot. I regret to buy, but I think I can do something with this. It's still a beautiful piece of wood. So what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to try and make pick guards out of this for the base that I'm working on. So I've drawn out some lines here on the parts that I think are bad, bad that I want to get off. Um, and we'll see what I'm left with. I think I'm going to start with a handsaw. All right. And I know I said this wood was punky and really, really soft. It really is punky and soft. Um, this is beyond spalting and borderline rotten in a lot of places, but it's just too cool looking for me just to discard. So I'm going to try and figure out the coolest section of this slab that is going to be usable regardless of how big it is, um, knowing that I can potentially do something cool with it anyway. So if I fail on this attempt, then I've got plenty of slab left over to work with. So I'm just really just hunting for the coolest piece. And as I do that, I realize my pick guard shape is probably going to have to change. 
So I start kind of fiddling around with that, and then finally it's like, you know what, just pick the coolest piece, go with that, and go from there. You've got plenty of wood to work with if that doesn't work out. So that was the plan. Now I'm real particular with some of the scraps that I felt like would be usable. So I start slicing them up on the bandsaw, thinking, hey, these might make cool block inlays later. Um, wasn't sure if I was gonna go with those on this base or not at this point, but I figured that's a good thing to test the cactus juice and see how I can stabilize this, uh, how well I can stabilize it. So now I've got my chunk. Um, I'm just get, trying to get a straight edge on it. So I come back to that particular cut with uh, some hand planes because I don't really trust that fence to be perfect because I'm going to end up trying to book match these. So start trying to resaw these. I know I don't have this saw dialed in at this point. I do later figure it out, uh, but I definitely did not by this episode. But I get it good enough. I still have to figure out the pick guard shape because right now this doesn't really this doesn't really work. My preferred shape for the pick guard does not fit within these book matches. So I would have to put all four of these together in kind of like a plus sign pattern, which I just I just don't know if I want to do. And I'm still not confident that these are going to be stable enough. So I got some experimentation to do with some of those smaller slices and the cactus juice. I'm going to test on those pieces because I don't really care if I screw those up, but these are really, really, really cool looking. So I want to make sure I get as much out of these as I can. And you can kind of see my first cut is very, very narrow at the bottom compared to the rest. So there may be some issues salvaging this piece because there's not a whole lot of material to work with to, once I start thicknessing it. Um, it's close to the actual thickness that I want it to be, which is pick guard size. And arguably I could, if I was better at resawing and had my saw dialed in perfectly, I could get more pieces out of this than I have. But again, I'm still learning. All right, now it's time to start stabilizing these pieces. But first, I gotta, I gotta land on the pick guard shape. So much waffling, much deliberation, much sketching and resketching, and trying to get creative with how I end up joining these two pieces together. And um, I end up loving the shape that I landed on, but it was not easy getting there. Uh, just so much back and forth and just drawing and sketching and erasing and redrawing and resketching and erasing and just rinsing and repeating until I finally land on something that's going to be cool. <laughs> and I'm still debating on the shape. That's crazy. And yes, I'm a cheapskate. I tried to set this thing in cactus juice in a Ziploc bag and going back and forth as many times as I did, of course I poke a hole in the bag and cause it to leak. So I've never used this cactus juice before, so that's why I'm just kind of testing and testing. And of course, like I said, I poked a hole in the bag leaked out so I put it in another bag because I didn't learn my lesson the first time. I end up going with just a baking pan and I start soaking all of the little potential block inlay scraps along with the pickboard blanks, uh, pick guard blanks in there and I let it sit with weights to keep them from floating for about a week before I end up taking it to the oven and baking it. All right now it's time to actually joint the neck and the fretboard. So I'm breaking out my 1904 Fulton Tools corrugated number seven plane. This is just a really, really cool thing to pull out and use, especially when you think it's 120 years old at this point. 
Um, just every time I use it, I can't help but think of all the things that had been used to make, who's owned it before, and it's just a joy to use. So you see me chiseling in the neck. That's because I took some shavings off of the, the top of the neck, which left the truss rod a little proud. So I was just setting it back down in there to get it flush before moving on to the fretboard. So now I am going to transfer where the truss rod needs to get access at the headstock end. After I trace that out, I start putting masking tape over the truss rod channel and uh, making sure I'm getting a good eighth inch all the way around the truss rod because I don't want glue to get into that truss rod channel at all. Um, and I want a nice tight fit. I don't want that truss rod rattling if it's not under tension. So I cover the whole thing, masking tape and all, and put every single small clamp I have pretty much in here. Uh, on this with a, a clamping call obviously on the front the front side where the fretboard is and you'll notice yes I did not cut the fret slots yet um, perhaps a rookie mistake I don't know that it's necessarily a bad thing uh, it just depends on how you're going to cut the fret slots and you'll see in the next episode that my chosen method was not very good The first thing I want to do is drill truss rod access. I would be lying if I didn't say that I was nervous in doing this because I've never done it. So fortunately I marked out where it needs to land in between those two black lines. So before I start anything else, I reestablish the center line on the fretboard. I mark out where I need to make the cuts for the nut slot based on the scale length that I'm shooting for, which I screwed up. But fortunately, all is well that ends well. So once I get my nut line established, then I can remove some of the excess of the fretboard that got glued onto the headstock. That was a stressful cut, but it was successful. Now it's time to take it over to the router table and then use a flush trim bit to flush it all up with the neck. Pretty happy overall with how it turned out so far. At this point, it's still thick. Um, I know that. Don't worry, I'll address it. Again, I lost more footage here of me poking the hole in the headstock to access the truss rod. If it looks off-center to you, it looks off-center to me, but I end up dealing with that once I veneer the headstock later. So don't worry, I get that looking nice and symmetrical. So now I've got it this far. It's time to start figuring out where my fret slots need to land. Um... At this point, I hadn't realized that I screwed up on a measurement and went to a 34 inch scale versus 35 inch scale. So I'm using a fret uh, marker calculator or a scale length calculator for fret slots uh, based on a 35 inch scale. And I think the base I'm referencing is 35 inches, but it's not, it's 34, which is where my mistake happened to begin with. So I ended up putting them side by side and realizing my marks didn't match. So I just decided to copy over the fret marks, uh, line the next fretboard to fretboard, nut to nut, and just transfer them over. And of course, while I got the strings off, why not throw some lemon oil on the fretboard? Now that I've got those, uh, I'm going back and make sure my center line still is center. And checking my bridge placement based on the new scale length and then transferring the marks from the side of the fretboard to the top of the fretboard. Now I'm going back with a precision protractor that has a center finding ruler and then also little slits cut at perpendicular marks to the long edge of the protractor. And that's what allows me to get perfectly perpendicular lines to that center line and why that center line is oh so important. And that's where I'm gonna leave this episode. 
You'll see why in episode three. All right, thank you so much for watching this episode down here in the basement. Uh, join me next time as we continue this build series and get closer and closer to what you see before you in this finished product and get a sound demo. So thank you again so much for watching and we'll see you again down here in the basement.